Welcome to the SOLA seminar. Today we have a research topic presented by Steve Strani, Associate Professor in Urban Planning here at Lincoln University. Um, uh, so today's session will be recorded. As per usual, um, people who are face to face, you can always ask questions at the end of the lecture. Uh, people who are online, uh, please feel free to either uh, write in your question in the chat box or wait until the end, open your mic and ask your question. Uh, please make sure that everyone's microphone is muted for those of you online. And yes, enjoy the seminar. Thank you, Hamish, for accepting our invitation. OK, thank you, everyone. This is my um, first attempt at a seminar in this sort of setting. Um, so if I look confused at some stage, it's because I am confused. OK, so uh, in some senses, more a reflection than a straight out research, but draws on um, a number of aspects of research, but also on professional practice. I do do work as a commissioner. I do do work as an expert witness, as a planner, and I put down the wrong one. <laughs> And um, I do do research on a number of areas related to what I'm talking about. So this is condensing some reflections over time and also aware that we have a major reformation of our legislation going on at the moment. So looking a little bit towards the future. Um, at one or two, I, I'm, they are reflections. Um, I might ripple some, um, some of those a little bit in terms of what I say. Um, and I hope I'm not going to be too controversial, but it might not be quite what people are expecting. So the structure of it, uh, I've got some introductory comments on changes in planning and uh, generally at the outset and just set up this, the context of planning because I realise that uh, for a number of you, planning may not be uh, as clearly understood as it is to me. So I'm going to do that at the start. Uh, then I'm going to talk about how um, the New Zealand planning legislation, because I, I work mainly in legal geographies, working on planning uh, law in particular, um, how that has framed the concept of landscape um, over the years, and then talk a little bit about a particular policy, which I think is particularly significant in terms of landscape, which is possibly not um, as well thought through or thought about as um, people probably could make, could make use of and then look a little bit at the future legislation and then some of the challenges that poses for uh, landscape architecture and planners. So that's the basic structure. Some key concepts I'll be mentioning all the way through. This is going to be, in many respects, incredibly boring. I know that you guys are interested in use a lot of visual images and stuff like that, but this is, um, you know, this is planning law talk in a sense. So there's a lot of words on these slides. I've tried to find photos in a couple of places, but really I, um, it's more about the words and how they mentally construct things and shape things than about the actual physical thing. So some of the words to keep in mind, landscape, obviously, um, natural character and amenity. Uh, you'll see those cropping up a few times to see how they connect or disconnect. OK, so first about planning. Uh, basically, there are a couple of types of planning that people tend to think of. There's what we call regulatory or statutory planning, which is basically able to be enforced by the courts and law. So the plans themselves create rules that can be enforced in law and people have to abide by them. That's where most of the, this is where this talk is focused. That's the area that I work in most. That's the, um, the key area for um, expert witnesses and people like that. Uh, <coughs> There's non-regulatory as well, and that's what, what planners do, which isn't um, sort of legally enforceable. That's where we go out and work with communities and help them come up with great designs, great things, um, or on the bigger sort of scale things, come up with things like, um, was it our space, which is the future urban growth planning for the for the area, totally unenforceable until it's actually put into enforceable plans, into the statutory plans. So you do all this visioning and so on, then you have to find a way of actually making it legally enforceable. Otherwise, it's just pretty pictures and words. <clears throat> and the other side of it is the implementation. And that's where you get um, permissions or resource consents or whatever, depending on which law you're working with, which um, plans and regulations you're working with, to actually get permission to do things that are provided for in plans and for those things where 
they're not provided for in plans and you need permission to do them anyway because of some other legislation or, or aspect. Uh, so planners work in all of these areas and landscape architects also come into all these areas. So talking about that, if we look at the role of planners and landscape architects in this sort of arena, planners are usually seen as evaluators and facilitators. When they give expert evidence more as an evaluation um, evidence, it's spread across the board, it's not a particular technical area of expertise. Basically, planners are masters of everything, and you need to remember that if you're a landscape architect, so we're the masters. Um, of course, the other thing is we're jack of all trades and masters of none. Um, their role is to facilitate the planning process, the plan making, and also the plan implementation. And uh, that differs from plan landscape architects who are seen as uh, technical experts in the planning legislation process, the planning law, the plan making, and so on. You bring technical expertise, and we lump your technical expertise alongside that of a whole lot of other technical experts and try and make sense of it. That's where the planners and the landscape architects tend to interface. Um, planners are not necessarily experts in landscape architecture, although they might like to think they're experts in the creation of places. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's good, I like that. That's, that's my uh, personal laugh machine. <laughs> Practicing planners and landscape architects in the planning verse, as opposed to the universe, the planner verse, um, tend to be normative orientation. You look at where things are going to be, what should happen. Um, tend to be spatially integrative. Uh, we have a sensibility about integrating things in space. Um, and together, I think we help reveal and make places and scapes. You'll see I've left land off that because I'm going to talk about other scapes as we go through. OK. Traditionally, the evaluative gaze has been um, objective, rational, neutral, facilitative in the public interest. This is how it was described. This is the role you know, planners were doing this sort of thing. Um, reality could be modelled, mapped, built and managed with a degree of precision and assumed accuracy and generality. That's a traditional approach to planning. I just have to say this because things have changed, but there's some sort of sense that this is still possible and a lot of scientists still fall into this category. Uh, we have to deal with them all the time, but we've changed from this sort of masculinist view of the world to a more feminist perspective. We're now aware of our subjectivity, our positionality and power relationships, the plurality of knowledges of the ways of seeing the world, the different ontologies that people have about what is real and what isn't real, um, how we are related to things and the relatedness of things becomes more important, the assemblages. And when we give evidence, we are now critically distanced, although some people call that objective, but it's slightly different, significantly different in my mind. Um, and these concepts are basically the ripples on our reflections as we work on the world, as we work with the world. Um, these help to um, how we construct our realities as we go through. Now, let's get back to the real world. That's the theory. We'll get back to what actually happens now. So now looking at the legislation, I just want to walk you through some major changes. Uh, for about 40 years, we had the Town and Country Planning Act. Uh, it went up until 1991, started about 1954. It was modified a number of times on the way through. And the Town and Country Planning Act was basically about wise use of resources and about development. And it was basically anthropocentric. It focused on human and their developments, their needs, what they were going to do. And as a result, it focused on what should be where. So where do you put things? Where do you put farmland? Where do you put forestry? Where do you put towns? Where do you do these things? And the plans basically were dominated about activities. Where are you going to put these activities in a broad sense? OK, the Resource Management Act came along in 1991 and said, we don't want to do that sort of top down directional planning of telling people where things should go. For one thing, we don't have the knowledge to know what is actually going to work well in a market and employment sort of sense. Uh, things change too rapidly for us to do that. We need to let people make the decisions, let the market make decisions, let the individuals make decisions, let communities make decisions. So they changed the whole planning approach and said, 
Um, we're no longer talking about development and wise use. We're talking about sustainable management. So we're actually taking the word development out of it. People globally talk about sustainable development. In New Zealand, they deliberately, deliberately went for sustainable management because they didn't want to say you have to develop. Okay, so um, sustainable management, uh, ecocentric, they're born things like the intrinsic um, nature of things, um, moved much more to um, thinking about the environment and the effects that people were having on the environment. So the orientation was very much on effects based planning and plans were supposed to be focused around what are the effects that are considered acceptable? What are the effects on the landscape that are considered acceptable? Rather than saying this is the landscape we want to do and this is the landscape we're going to put here, an industrial one there, an educational one there, um, recreational landscape there. But what are the effects that we um, that we want to deal with? What are the adverse effects we want to minimise in the way that we go ahead with our development and our use? That's really hard for people to get their heads around because you no longer think about something you understand, an educational precinct, even if you have many different views of that, you're thinking about what are all the things an educational precinct might actually adversely affect. And educational precincts could be in all sorts of different designs. So people do things differently to fit with the environments. It's no wonder that we have a really um, incredibly high rate of um, positive outcomes for resource consents because everyone looks at the plans, works out what they have to do to meet all their adverse effects, carry out all the mitigation and so on works that they need to do, and then they apply for their consent and they get it approved. So 99% of 99% plus applications for resource consents are approved because people know what the adverse effects are that they have to meet and how to deal with them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So combine both sort of neoliberal ideas and communal ideas because the community actually had the role of deciding what were in the plans uh, that were important to the community. So what affects the community? Then individuals can deal, do what they like with their land, provide they're not having adverse effects on community values. That was a sort of approach to things. OK, um, a lot of landowners say that's not really right because we can't do this that, next on our land. You're only restricted if the activities you're having will affect values that the community has identified and says are of concern. For instance, viewscapes, being able to see a particular volcanic cone from downtown um, Auckland may mean that they put restrictions on your ability to build into that view from a particular point. Okay. So it's the effect that you're having on that view that is of concern to the community. Uh, so we went from activities based to effects based. Now, what's being proposed uh, to come in later this year, and we're not really sure what it is yet because it's still going through the process, but we've got some broad outlines and directions, is the um, Natural and Built Environments Act. And they released a draft of the key parts of that, and they got a lot of submissions on that. We don't know how much they'll change in response to those submissions, but uh, that was introduced. And there's also going to be a Spatial Planning Act, which is going to set basically regional level directions for where things are going to be put and placed and located, which sounds very much like what we had back in the 1950s. And we're going backwards to the future, in a sense, with what's being proposed. Um, the main reason for doing this is to address climate change and housing affordability. Those have been the big complaints, especially housing affordability. And plans have been incorrectly and totally wrongly misrepresented as causing the problems with housing affordability. Um, I'm not going to go there in a whole discussion, but it really is not the case. Um, climate change, we've been very laggard on that, partly because uh, in the early 2000s, 2004, the government decided that you couldn't consider the effects of your activities on climate change as part of New Zealand's planning system. So they took it out, they specifically said you can't do this in your plans. They brought it back in, uh, supposed to start um, January this year, supposed to be able to start to consider the effects of your activities on greenhouse gas emissions. And they've postponed that because they're doing major reforms. So it's been postponed for another uh, 12 months at least um, before they let that happen. So we still can't consider under the Resource Management Act your greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. <clears throat> so. Those are the two things they're going to do, but also much more recognition of treaty partnerships. So there's a, I call it a treaty partnership flavour because 
it's not clear yet whether it will actually deliver in a form of treaty partnerships as a whole. But certainly the language is coming in there, whether it will be reflecting the empowerment of, of uh, Tangara Whenua, we have yet to see. OK, so now I want to talk about landscape planning, uh, landscape in a planner verse, okay, our universe. Starting with the Town and Country Planning Act, 1977, um, there are three types of plans in particular, they called them schemes in those days, uh, regional, district and maritime. Okay. Um, I'll start with the district scheme. It had to give effect to uh, basically policies and objectives at the regional level um, and contain the scheme in terms of landscape. I, and I searched it for landscape to find that all the places landscape was mentioned, it was mentioned three times. Um, so the preservation of conservation of trees, bush, plants, landscape, and areas of special amenity value. Um, so you have to give effect to policy and objectives contained in the scheme relating to the preservation or conservation of landscape and areas of special amenity value. Note that areas of special amenity value are separate from landscape. Okay. So is amenity part of landscape? Is it an issue or something that landscape uh, architects should be considering? Also, the design and external appearance of buildings is also separate from landscape, but of course it could contribute to landscape. And all of these things could contribute to your landscape assessment, but they do have them separated out in the Town Country Planning Act. Um, in the regional schemes, they set out the type and general location of development, uh, set out a regional pattern, and form of urban and rural development. They identified areas of growth, identified areas set aside from urban development for highly productive land, natural hazards, aesthetic or recreational value, or to separate and to enhance the appearance and setting of cities and towns. So you get landscape architects tend to come in here, helping to separate and enhance the cities and towns by saying this should be rural, this is how you should make the appearance of a town look good, um, and high aesthetic and in some sense, recreational value fitting in there as well. These things less so, but um, this is coming back in uh, in the new regime and natural hazards already back in. Uh, and, you know, and under the regional schemes, I identified the regional pattern of urban and industrial employment centres. So you see what I mean about this being very much a, a anthropocentric type tool. In the regional schemes, um, landscape comes in again. Uh, natural resource and environment is a clause, clause of the, of the Act. The identification, preservation and development of the region's natural resources, which include water, um, things like that, farmlands, um, forests, fisheries, mineral areas, and areas of value for the enjoyment of nature and the landscape. So basically, the identification, preservation and development of um, Areas of value for the enjoyment of the landscape. Okay. So those sort of drove or sort of driven landscape architects at the time. Okay. Um, in the second schedule, the matters to be dealt with the uh, district plans, the preservation or conservation of building the sector of visual appeal. So you start to get visual appeal coming in here. Trees, bush, plants, or landscape of scientific, wildlife, or historic interest or of visual appeal. So a landscape can have all of these components in it or be of visual appeal. Um, the amenities again are separated out. And in a sense, one and two are actually separate, separated from, um, sorry, one and three are actually separated from two, which has a landscape in it. This has visual appeal in it, but it brings it into here again. So there's a bit of an overlap, visual appeal here and, and landscape deals with visual appeal. So there, Landscape is covered here, but it interconnects and overlaps with visual appeal in one. A lot of emphasis on visual appeal is the point I'm trying to get across here. <coughs> um, and the third schedule, the maritime schemes, these are for the marine area. The preservation or conservation of flora and fauna in their habitats and stretches of coastline. I think there's a closer get to landscape here. Uh, of science, everything else there is pretty much the same as for landscape. This is called stretches of coastline. Um, structures, objects and areas of historic or other interest or of visual appeal. Um, and 
aesthetic considerations and the preservation of views. So you'll excuse me if I think that in my understanding of landscape architecture, under the Town Country Planning Act, you are basically about how to make, how to judge whether things look good or for the various criteria that made it look good. So it's very much a visual orientation. Um, right. There were a couple of things of matters of national importance brought in under the Town Country Planning Act. These were amendments that were brought in at various stages, but by 1977, these were there. The preservation of the natural character of the coastal environment and the margins of lakes and rivers, etc. Uh, and here was where architects um, also played a major role. Landscape architects were brought in because what on earth is natural character? What scientific discipline can tell you what natural character is? Okay, do we have a discipline of natural character? No. Um, character implies something soft and fuzzy. Um, who's a soft and fuzzy discipline with technical expertise? Oh, landscape architect. Okay, so landscape architects were giving a lot of the evidence in relation to um, what was natural character in here and so on. And um, there's a case law accepted during this time that modified environments can have natural character, even a landscape of um, exotic pasture with sheep grazing on it has natural character. Well done, landscape architects, for arguing that one through. We appreciated that, us farmers. Um, so this is sort of the case law is what develops as the courts try to interpret the law and particular provisions of the law. It's what they mean. Okay. It did actually have a definition of character. The term character in relation to the use of any land with regards to the um, shall be construed with regard to the effect of that use upon the amenities of the neighbourhood. Now remember I said amenity was split previously from landscape, it always appeared differently. It so, suddenly tied in with the concept of character and the amenities of a neighbourhood. So then you start to get into, if you're an urban sort of design, urban planning, you get landscape architects talk about whether trees add to the amenity of a neighbourhood or not. Do they look good? Do they add to the value of the neighbourhood? Those sort of issues. So amenities start to creep into and landscape architects start to get involved in that area uh, as well, because amenities means those qualities and conditions in the area which contribute to the pleasantness, harmony and coherence of the environment and to its better enjoyment. And again, these are softness like pleasantness, harmony, coherence. What discipline has skills in that? We know psychologists. Uh, actually, landscape architects. And there's also the phrase about aesthetic considerations I've mentioned previously. What are aesthetic considerations? Maybe this is what comprises aesthetic considerations. So various words in the act have to be interpreted on the ground um, by professionals and by the courts in many cases. So where amenities fits in relation to landscape architecture, I'm not quite sure, but it does seem to have a connection when you start to talk about character, natural character, or about neighbourhoods and how they look or are. OK, now we move to the whole new regime of the planners uh, of the um, Planiverse, the Resource Management Act, which came in in 1991. And I've already gone through before that moves from plan where things go and so on to look at the effects of things on the environment. What effects do you want and not want? OK, right up front, matters of national importance brought through from the Town Country Planning Act. And actually, this was to the relationship of Mara and the culture, which is why I've got there because I forgot to look, put it on the other slide. But this came through as well. Um, the preservation of natural character of the coastal environment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the protection of them from inappropriate use, basically. So, preservation of the natural character is a matter of national importance. The protection of outstanding natural features and landscapes. No, the separate from of features from landscapes. Okay, I don't think anyone has ever argued that features are dominantly the preserve of landscape architects to identify what a feature is. Because what is a feature? It has to be a feature of a landscape or something like that. We're still not quite sure about that, but we basically rely on landscape architects to tell us what features are important and what are outstanding. So immediately you start getting this, you have to say, what's your scale for deciding what's outstanding? How do you do that? And what scale is this? Um, this actually applies at regional, so what's outstanding regionally? What's outstanding at a district level is how is what's included in district plan. And you can also have nationally outstanding um, things as well, which come in in all 
through all of these. So something might be outstanding at district level, but it's not actually outstanding regionally and certainly not outstanding at a national level. But something that's outstanding nationally will be outstanding at all levels. OK. Um, right. And you can see, as say, um, Tangata Fenua brought in in a way. Now, I did Google, I did search for landscape in the RMA and came up with um, several different places. But because I said on landscape, I got landscaped as well. Uh, and this is um, brought in last year. It was, um, and this relates to medium distance to the residential sites. Some of you may have heard of these. These are the three by threes, three residential dwellings, three story height on a on a um, on a lot, basically, uh, to deal with the affordability issues and to create more intense housing, deal with climate change by keeping everyone close together, make us like Europe, the place we all left to come here for. So, um, in here they talk about landscaped area, and you can see what um, people do with the landscaped area. A minimum of 20% of a developed site with grass or plants, and can include the canopy of trees, regardless of ground treatment below them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this to me is gardening on a slightly grander scale. And many gardening businesses already offer landscapes um, services, which may or may not include the landscape architect. But you guys, you've got a good career here in the future with these um, sites. Uh, more generally, um, there's information required in the assessment of environmental effects. So anyone applying for resource consent has to provide an assessment of the environmental effects of that activity they're applying for. And the assessment of the activity's effects on the environment must address the following matters. And B is any physical effect on the locality, including any landscape and visual effects. Landscape separate from visual again, but they seem to be linked. Not quite sure how. So any landscape and visual effects. I'm not going to go into these, but there's been a whole lot of case law developed under the RMA about um, what, how you go about doing these sort of assessments. Um, the last version I can remember was the Pigeon Bay, modified Pigeon Bay um, criteria, and there's a whole set of criteria in the case still there. Um, I'm sure uh, Shannon or Nadia, Nada might be able to um, tell you a bit more about those if you wanted to. Um, but you look at how those might apply, and you also find in various plans, and this was one of the Queenstown Lakes District plan, um, they want to guard against over domesticated um, landscapes. So you have to start to think, how do you define what is an over domesticated landscape? What's a domesticated landscape? Okay. Um, I actually had a student do a master's thesis on this um, because we found it such an interesting concept. But you get strange sort of concepts cropping up as people try and find ways of actually controlling the spread of um, urban areas or trying to maintain particular characters of areas. One of the key things that came through under these sort of uh, consents on resource consent applications, the implementation side of the RMA, was that the case law has accepted that ecological processes are part of natural character. And the landscape architect of significance here, Simon Smale, um, he brought this in, um, partly when he was talking about the spectrum of pristine to completely modified character. So we talk about natural character, you have pristine natural character, which we don't have anywhere in the world because there's nothing that's absolutely pristine, but we have close to it in places like Fjordland, versus complete modified, which would be um, downtown, I would say Christchurch, but with all the earthquakes, we now have lots of natural character coming back in and involuntarily. Um, but in Auckland, downtown Auckland, totally modified, totally controlled. Okay, so we've got a range there. Um, and Simon Smale had to argue this in a resource consent hearing to get this concept in there and then say, this particular landscape is at the uh, less modified end and should be preserved in that way. It was around a subdivision proposal at Taupo on a natural forested area. And basically the argument was that um, just by putting trees in pots, so that the canopy, the visual impact, the visual look of the landscape is, remains the same, even though you've developed the whole area, um, that does not mean that you've retained the natural character because these trees are artificially maintained. So there'd be a big loss of natural character. And therefore, the subdivision should not go ahead. Um, these trees, plants and pots should not be seen as mitigating the loss of natural character. Okay. Now, in some of my own hearings, um, one that completely 
you know, often comes up, and I'm involved in, I specialise in coastal marine areas, which is why there's a coastal marine theme to this talk. Uh, mussel farms. These are mussel farms, uh, marine farming, uh, in a very attractive part of New Zealand. And um, those opposed to mussel farms see these as industrial, creating an industrial character to the to the setting. The proponents of the um, of the area said, actually, no, this is more like a rural farming setting because the zones on shore were rural farmland. So they said this is uh, very much in keeping with the with the farming character of the neighbourhood. Uh, you could also say it's a good tourist landscape because all tour boats come in here to have a look at it, even though they might totally oppose it. Um, they come in here, kayakers come in here to look at this because it's, it's a feature in the landscape. This is a, it's not a natural feature, but it's certainly a feature in the landscape. Um, so you start to get um, issues over how these defined. This is where landscape architects get into opposition in the in the environment court hearings. As to, is this industrial or farming? What is it? Is it natural or not? How natural is it? Is it significantly modified? Okay. <sighs> um, I just want to throw this throw this in there as well. Um, the RMA also has something picked up from previous legislation, water conservation orders, and they may provide for any of the following. The preservation as far as possible in its natural state of any water body, that's something fairly significant, a river or a lake or something like that, um, or maybe um, uh, a poo, poo springs, I can't think of a full name, but a, a, a very significant springs in north of New Zealand. Um, so there's considered to be outstanding and the protection as opposed to preservation of characteristics which any water body has or contributes to and which are considered to be outstanding. So characteristics which are considered to be outstanding. Te Wahua Lake Ellesmere, bird life, characteristic of that water body, outstanding. So therefore, because of the bird life, that's one of the reasons why there's a water conservation order on uh, Lake Ellesmere Te Wahua. Okay. But Lake Ellesmere Te Wahua is also in the coastal environment under the new definition of coastal environment. And as you'll see shortly, there's an issue about whether you should avoid farming or aerospace developments in these sort of areas. I say aerospace because Rocket Lab proposed to build a launching site there at one stage. OK. Are seascapes landscapes? Uh, is a seascape a landscape? Why? It's not on land. Yeah, well, we decided that we couldn't just rely on the courts to decide that. So I was actually in, um, in working in government when we did this. Um, but in 1994, the first New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement, we put in policy 1.13, uh, it is a national priority to protect the following features, which in themselves are in combination, blah, 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 uh, part of the coastal environment, landscapes, seascapes, and landforms. So we actually wrote them in there. This was how we got it into the legislation. Seascapes are not in the legislation. We slipped them in through the national policy statement because we want to be sure that seascapes could be covered. Um, and then it's got things like landforms, the variety, etc. That's really geomorphologist area. Visually or scientifically significant geological features, so visual. Um, and the collective characteristics which give the coastal environment its natural character, including wild and scenic areas. Uh, again, this was initially seen as being the preserve of landscape architects. Uh, <coughs> we'll come back to that shortly. In 2010, they rewrote the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement. And here I want to just focus on what to do or what to include in landscapes. So it says you have to protect the natural features of natural landscapes. This time they put in brackets, including seascapes. Because they didn't want to have that separation between landscape and seascape in case someone actually challenged it as whether it was um, correct in law to have seascapes as well as landscapes. But if you say that uh, landscapes include seascapes, then you're safer in law. So uh, landscapes include seascapes of the coastal environment. And then had these really important provisions put in. Avoid adverse effects on outstanding landscapes, seascapes, whatever. So include Te Wahua Lake Halsme if it was labelled as an outstanding landscape. Avoid significant adverse effects, and then avoid remedy or mitigate other adverse effects. So if, you can, if it's not a significant adverse effect, then you don't have to avoid it. You should, there's a first step, but if you can remedy or mitigate it, say with your designs and so on, then that's okay. 
But these things avoid adverse effects on outstanding areas, avoid significant. This was like a bombshell thrown into the planning world and into the development world. Because suddenly, up until then, I should say up until then, people be quite happily putting outstanding landscapes into their um, plans and so on, because they didn't really have a big effect in terms of the outcome of decisions. They always got weighed up against other things and then counter, you know, didn't give us up enough weight to be dominant factors. Once you've got the avoid in there and you've got the um, King Salmon decision from the Supreme Court, highest court in the land, or see, um, said basically avoid means avoid. Okay, so you can't do things that would have adverse effect on outstanding landscapes. And you have to avoid significant adverse effects. Well, suddenly all these areas appear being saying this is an outstanding landscape. Suddenly the developers say, my God, that means I can't do anything. I can't put a jetty out there. I can't moor my boats, possibly. I can't put a marine farm there. Um, I can't do anything. So it suddenly becomes much more contested. Uh, so we've had court case after court case after court case over what is outstanding natural character. Um, <clears throat> what are sorry? What are outstanding landscapes in the coastal marine area or in the coastal environment? And this is going on all the time. There's court court decisions still in process right now in different parts of the country as people try and draw the lines and redraw them. Okay, there's been huge implications. So that's what I say is um, if Lake Kelvin Tewahua is an outstanding natural landscape, could you have farming on Kaitariti Spit? Could you have um, you know, aerospace development there would have a significant adverse effect, would have a less than significant adverse effect, would have a, you know, an effect at all. Maybe we have to avoid adverse effects. Would the effect be adverse? Hasn't been tested in court yet, that one. OK. Required action under policy 15 of the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement, you have to identify and assess natural landscapes in the region and at the district level. So this has to be carried out. Uh, and this is at a minimum by land typing, soil characterization, characterization and landscape characterization. So a lot of landscape architects clearly involved in landscape characterization as part of the planning process at that large scale. In doing so, they have to have regard to, in doing your characterization and so on, and identifying these areas, there's a whole lot of natural science factors that are listed, including the, um, the presence of water, Legibility, expressiveness, um, you know, how well does it express the formative nature of how it came to be the landscape it is. Um, aesthetic values, including memorability and uh, naturalness. Um, vegetation, native and exotic, so it includes exotic as in there. Transient values, values shared and recognised. Uh, culture and spiritual values for tangata whenua, um, which have to be worked out in the accordance with tikanga Māori. Um, as far as possible, and historical and heritage associations and wild or scenic values. So a whole lot of factors have to be uh, had regard to in, our net, in characterising those natural areas. There's also a separate policy for natural character. So we separate natural character from landscape architecture, or from landscape here. And this is where you now have ecologists having major say in natural landscape, natural character of landscapes, geomorphologists having major say in what is the natural character. And now the um, Landscape architects appearing in the hearings are uh, differentiating between whether they're giving evidence on landscape or natural character. Landscape can contribute to natural character, obviously, and there's a whole list of things that are in there as to what uh, natural character may include, but specifically of realms to um, landscape, landscape architecture, places or areas that are wild or scenic, a range of natural character from pristine to modified, um, which obviously come from Simon Smale's work, and experiential attributes. I helped get this in here, by the way. Those are one, ones I'm most proud of. Um, sound and smell of the sea, the context. So moving away from just visual to actually incorporating the sense of being there. Um, we made, made that argument very strongly in the hearing, and uh, they asked us to back it up with some evidence. I gave them a copy of a master's uh, thesis on this, on the importance of sound and its effect on natural character. OK, implications for planning, planners and landscape architects. There are no equivalent policies in New Zealand coastal policy for terrestrial environments. So still business as usual, pretty much. Um, go in there, argue and get outweighed by all the economic values. 
Assessments of landscapes and natural character are much more contested now than they used to be, especially in the marine environment. And landscape architects are no longer the go-to for natural character assessment. There's a conflict going on out there between landscape architects and ecologists and various other people. Um, but they do contribute due to the overlap, so they are involved in that. Features still seem to be landscape architects only, although there are some geomorphologists now trying to nail down features because landscape architects tend to value vegetation and undervalue the actual physical feature in their view. Um, cultural and spiritual values, as I said, have to be in there um, for Tangata Whenua, identified by working as far as practicable in accordance with Tikanga Māori, including their expression as cultural landscapes and features. That's taken directly from the um, from the phrasing in coastal policy, I think it is. Where are we going in 2022? Uh, the Natural Built Environment Act and the Spatial Planning Act. Partnership language is very prominent. How that's going to be interpreted, that's going to be a whole set of new case law. Um, housing affordability and climate change, I mentioned already, are big things. It's a bit of a return to the country planning act. We know they're going to do regional spatial planning of where things are supposed to go. And that's to help try and deal with climate change by condensing um, developments and keeping um, more areas free of development to soak up carbon. Um, we have current national policy statement, which basically encourages sprawl. We have a supposedly, we're supposed to have national policy statements on highly productive land, should come out any time, and on indigenous biodiversity, also should come out any time, but who knows? They've been coming out any time for a long time. Uh, the NPSs that we're going to have are likely to include specified limits and partnership concepts, and they will form a national set of strong directions, the national objective framework. And I have to ask myself, how will limits address natural character? Will it be 20% of the, of the coastline has to be preserved natural character? If it's more than 20%, you've crossed the threshold. Or should that be 70% has to be natural character? How are they going to work out these sort of things if they're going to set limits on them? It's easy to do it with um, chemical composition of water. It's damn sight hard to do it with something as complex as a landscape. Um, amenity is, we've been told by Minister of, for the Environment, amenity will not appear in the Act. He's totally against amenity. He says there's a major barrier to affordable housing because neighbourhoods argue that the neighbourhood would be affected by the loss of amenity values if you do certain densification. So he's been quite clear that it's going. With that actually is the end result. I always wait until I see what comes out of Parliament before I um, start teaching this stuff. Opportunities for landscape architects. And from, from a planner perspective, mitigation and remedy opportunities abound. You can go out there and design all sorts of things to deal with heat reduction in the urban environment, um, GHG absorbing plans for for farm areas or wherever city areas, um, flood erosion, fire resistance, e.g. green fire breaks, what trees do you put in there to prevent fire, those sort of things. Um, indigenous biodiversity, how you promote that, just about through. Water sensitive design in urban areas, especially, and um, urban, rural, and marine seascaping. I'll come back to seascaping in a moment. Um, Tikanga Māori will have to be important in everything, but you also need to note there's increasing diversity of cultures here. And um, feng shui design, for instance, are quite common in areas that are uh, predominantly um, Chinese um, community. So you have to start to think about feng shui and things like that as well. Okay. I mentioned urban seascape, so this is the sort of things you might um, see in the future. And this is taken from an article just published in the Lincoln Planning Review uh, by Su Jong Ryu, who is a landscape architect and who was uh, based here at Lincoln for six months last year. Um, and she's looking very much at urban seascape. There's a whole article in Lincoln Planning Review on this. I recommend it to you. Um, at ways of using um, the natural environment of the sea to plan for rising sea levels and how you integrate those into cities. And she takes the example of um, Wellington, where they've actually done the sort of pre-designed rock pools and so on and staged reefs, concrete reefs into the city. So urban seascaping. There's also been quite dominant of Wellington's um, landscape architecture school uh, and working with the Pacific Islands and places like that. So the pe pe people doing theses on these um, up there. OK, key challenges. Spatial plan with thresholds and limits I've mentioned. How will future regional landscapes and so on incorporate concepts of outstanding land and seascapes? And how to incorporate THG resilience, biodiversity into future productive land use models? And I 
come down to myself, are we producing landscape architects and planners with the knowledge base, the theoretical and skill competencies to operate in these multi-planning verses that we're operating in? Can we operate in these sudden changing environments from the RMA to the future environment where we're directing things to go again? And how are we going to do that in a way that deals with climate change, biodiversity and housing affordability? Key things are going to be in there. Any questions? <laughs>